Okay. All right. So we'll uh, we'll go ahead and uh, and get started here. Um, it is uh, it's fourth week Monday. So uh, so happy Monday, you guys. And uh, and we are that means we are also over uh, halfway through our quarter, or whatever summer session it is. Um, so uh, midterm grades, I think, uh, have been posted. You can take a look. Uh, overall, the uh, the class did uh, pretty well. Uh, I think the median was something around a 92, um, so um, pretty good overall. Uh, um, you know, if if you didn't do well or uh, didn't do as well as you would have liked, um, you know, don't feel bad. It was just uh, it's just one test in one class, um, and uh, and yeah, you know, your your exams scores, your grades, uh, you know, are not. Uh, an indication of who you are uh, and, and we should not kind of judge ourselves based on our performance and you know on tests or even even our income or whatever it might be right so the world likes to use these things to judge our character but this that's not um, but I'm not about that so um, we will uh, we'll continue on in um, kind of the second half of our course which is going to focus uh, primarily on statistical inference. And so, you know, up until now, what we've been doing is we've been focusing on um, kind of the uh, kind of the foundations for statistics. We've been talking about uh, being able to describe our data. And, uh, and we also uh, spent uh, the last week looking at probability and uh, seeing, uh, trying to understand randomness. And what we're going to do um, in the remaining uh, weeks of our course is that we're going to bring together our understanding of randomness along with our ability to describe data in order to make conclusions uh, about the population. So um, once again, here is kind of uh, the slide that covers the, uh, the big pictures of our course. And, uh, and we have covered, I would say, you know, the, the first four and the, the last three weeks are really just about the statistical tools that we're going to learn. So, you know, um, you know, in this course, what we want to do is we want to make conclusions. We want to make conclusions uh, from data that we've observed. Okay. And the conclusions that we're making, uh, number two, is that the conclusions we make are always about populations. Populations being everybody um, that's relevant to answering our question. And we um, cannot directly observe the population because it's uh, just simply too big for us to observe directly. And so, um, you know, what we do is we look at our sample of data and sometimes in our sample, we'll observe an association between the variables. And we've looked at being able to describe associations between linear, um, between uh, numeric variables with linear regression. We also looked at being able to describe associations you know, in the term, in terms of, are these events or outcomes independent or not? And so, um, so we can talk about associations with, you know, numeric variables and also categorical variables. And, uh, and so key point three is that even if we observe an association between variables in our data, that could mean there's an association in the population, or it could also mean that the association that we see is just a random fluke. So um, we always have to consider that possibility that maybe, maybe what we're seeing is just a random fluke. And so learning probability teaches us about randomness, right? And, and so we spent the last week learning about probabilities of random events as well as probability distributions. And learning about randomness will allow us to decide if the data we have is a random fluke, or if it's an indication that there really is an association in the population, okay? And so that brings us to point five, which is what's gonna be the focus of the rest of our course, is we're going to learn a variety of statistical tools like the confidence interval, the z-test, and the t-test, and these tools all kind of quantify, they produce numeric values to help us make these conclusions. And so, um, so that's what we are uh, going to focus on is um, the, the rest of these um, kind of tools. Now, 
of course, uh, you know, for the exams in our class, you know, you will have to remember how to do the confidence interval Z test and T test. But if, uh, you know, 10 years from now, if after you graduate and everything, um, if you forget all the details about the confidence interval Z test and T test, you won't hurt my feelings too much. I, um, you know, if, if you're not going to major in statistics or something and you forget the details of these things, I, I can live with that. But, uh, but I do hope uh, the ideas of making conclusions from data, I do hope that sticks with you. All right, so um, this is kind of what, um, what we've covered. Okay, so in week one, I know, it, I don't know about you, but uh, it feels like we've been in our class longer than uh, three weeks, but that's, uh, that's been the entirety of our time in the course is that, uh, so maybe it's gone by very quickly for you or maybe it feels like it's dragged on. But um, we started at the beginning of August and, um, and now um, we're in week four. And within that time, um, we've covered chapters one through six in, the, in those first three weeks. And then the remaining three weeks, we'll, we will uh, kind of, I don't know if slow things down is the right word, but, um, but the pacing changes and we are going to spend um, the last three weeks on three chapters, okay? So while we're kind of averaging um, two chapters a week, now we're gonna slow it down to about one chapter a week. And I think it's appropriate because um, in my experience, um, chapters eight and chapter, chapters eight and nine are quite um, heavy chapters for students to, uh, to get a kind of, uh, a handle on. Um, I mean, relatively speaking, um, you know, uh, most of you are knocking it out of the park here. So, um, so, you know, for, for many of you won't present a challenge at all. Okay. And this is kind of the picture that, um, that we are at. So in the first half of our course, uh, this is what we've covered. And so, you know, we covered descriptive statistics kind of in our first uh, week, week or so, first week and a half, and then the, uh, the, the second week and a half, the second three lectures were about probability and probability distributions. And so today we are going to cover sampling distributions, and then starting Wednesday, we'll, uh, well actually even starting today, after we cover sampling di distributions, we'll get into statistical inference, okay, which is, um, which again combines our understanding of the summary values from des descriptive statistics and our understanding of probabilities. So this is, um, this is where, uh, where we are headed. All right, so um, I just wanna um, just uh, go back and review a couple key ideas about samples and sampling. So we, we mentioned this, or I mentioned this at the, uh, the very beginning of the course, uh, the idea of working with samples rather than um, populations. And so um, before we get into sampling distributions, we need, to, we need to talk about just some basic stuff here, okay? And then once we cover sampling distributions, we'll look at conf, uh, the central limit theorem and confidence intervals, okay? So the, uh, once again, the, the population, the population, is everyone, everyone who is relevant to answering the research questions of interest, okay? Um, it's whether, you know, whether that population is, you know, uh, all uh, potential voters or um, all people who, uh, you know, have a certain disease or, um, you know, whatever it might be, the population is, is everyone uh, who's relevant to, um, to answer the, uh, the, the research question, okay? And, uh, and the problem, of course, is that the population is too big, okay, for us to study directly. We don't have the resources to interview everyone. We don't have the ability to get measurements for net, from everyone. So instead, we have to deal with a sample, right? And so if, if you're doing a political opinion poll, you might have to do some random digit dialing. Maybe you get to sample, you know, 600 potential voters, likely voters. Or if you're doing a medical study, maybe you get a sample of 50 people, okay? And so, you know, it depends on um, 
you know, the resources that are available to you, you get a sample. And so the sample is going to be a selection of people taken from the population. Um, ideally, the sample is going to be representative of the population. You want the sample that you're going to look at to be kind of a miniature version of the population. Uh, you know, whatever that means, right? And so um, what we do is that the researcher is then going to record information about the individuals in the sample, and that's going to form your observed data. Okay, and based on the data from the sample, we then try to make conclusions about the population. Right? And that's kind of the, the overall process that we want to do. And so when we're talking about summary values and ways to um, describe um, either the sample or the population, we have different terms in order to kind of um, help us uh, know what we're talking about. And so a parameter, a parameter is a numeric summary of the population, whereas a statistic is a numeric summary of the sample. So if we are talking about the average age in the population, that's a parameter. If you're talking about the average age of your sample, that's a statistic, okay? So you're talking about kind of the same thing, whether it's you know the, the mean age in the population or the mean age of your sample, but the fact that one is describing the population makes it a parameter, or if it's describing a sample, it becomes a statistic, okay? Um, if your sample is representative of the population, your sample's statistic should be close in value to the population parameter. Um, the parameter, you know, or statistic, we could also be talking about the proportion. It could be something like um, the proportion of people in the population that support a certain candidate. And the statistic, corresponding statistic, would be the proportion of people that support that candidate in a sample, okay? So, um, statistical inference is a process of using, well, again, we're going to use a sample statistic to make conclusions about the corresponding population parameter, right? So it's just important that we understand, um, that we remember that whenever we're talking about the population, we describe it with a parameter. Whenever we're talking about a sample, we're describing it with a statistic, okay? So here's just a couple examples, right? So a political poll is conducted. It surveys a sample of 800 likely voters. So the population would be all likely voters, okay? The sample has the following statistic, meaning a, a sample proportion of 44% support candidate John Q. Public, right? So you say, you know, are you gonna vote for this politician or this candidate? 44% in the sample say, yes, I'm gonna support this person. And so based on what you see in the sample, based on the statistic, we make a conclusion about the parameter. The parameter, the corresponding parameter is the proportion of all the voters who will vote for John Q. Public, okay? Here's, a, here's another example. Um, we can do a medical experiment on blood pressure medication, right? So we wanna see, is this medication effective at maybe reducing blood pressure or something like that, okay? So we have a sample of say 50 volunteers that have high blood pressure and the population then would be everyone with high blood pressure who might take the medication. Um, and in the experiment, we randomly assign medication to half and we assign placebo to the other half. And at the end of the experiment, we're gonna observe the following statistics. The mean blood pressure of patients in our sample with medication is 125 millimeters of mercury whereas the mean blood pressure of patients in our sample with placebo is 135 millimeters of mercury. And therefore, the difference between the means in our samples is 10 millimeters of mercury, okay? So we observe a difference of 10 millimeters, and we wanna make a conclusion about the parameter, which would be, uh, you know, we observe a difference of 10 millimeters between the two um, kind of our two subgroups, our samples, the sample that got placebo and the sample that got um, the medication. And we have to assume that there's corresponding groups in the population. The population would be everyone uh, who, who might get placebo and everybody who might get um, 
the actual medication and we want to know what's the, uh, the difference between the means in the population. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to make a conclusion about the parameter, which would be the difference between mean blood pressures of everyone who might use the medication versus those who get placebo. All right. And, um, you know, there's this whole, um, this subject of statistical inference is, uh, is very broad and very deep. And as far as our class goes, we're just going to scratch the surface of it. Okay, it's an intro level class. We're going to cover um, something called um, the confidence interval and the hypothesis test. Okay, and we're going to learn some basic uh, confidence intervals and hypothesis test techniques using, um, we're going to look at categorical variables using proportions. And when we look at numerical, numeric variables, we're going to be looking at means, okay? And so this is kind of just, just the basics of statistical inference. And again, um, you know, if you're interested, if you want to learn more statistics, uh, there's going to be a lot more statistical inference methods, you know. Um, but uh, but as, as far as an intro level class, this is, um, this is as far as we're going to get, okay? And, uh, and this will take us through chapter nine in our textbook which is, um, I think the essential statistics textbook goes up to chapter 10. And so I, I would feel pretty good about getting through nine, nine out of 10 chapters in our six week course here. All right, so when, um, when we write statements about um, statistical inference, okay, you know, we need to be able to distinguish between parameters and statistics. And so when you use words, it's, it's easy. You just say, oh, um, here's the mean. And in order to kind of distinguish whether you're talking about the mean of a population or the mean of a sample, you just use the word, um, I'm talking about the population mean, or I'm talking about the sample mean. Okay, and that, that helps us distinguish between whether we're talking about the mean of a sample or the mean of a population, okay? When we, um, when we use symbols for the, uh, the same thing, in order to distinguish between um, the mean of a population or the mean of a sample, we have different symbols, okay? So the mean of the population uses mu. This is the Greek letter uh, mu. Um, it's the kind of the Greek letter for the M, uh, M for mean, okay? And then we have the, for the population standard deviation, we have the Greek letter sigma. Okay, it looks like a, an O with a line on top, but this is actually the corresponding letter for S, um, and that's the Greek sigma. And um, if we're dealing with the proportion of a population, we just use the letter P. If we're dealing with samples, okay, the sample mean is X bar, okay, X with a bar over it. Uh, the sample standard deviation is S, and the sample proportion is P with a little cap over it, and we call that P hat, okay? And so, um, you know, it's, it's important for us to distinguish whether we're talking about the mean of this population or the mean of the sample. And so we, we can use words or we can use different symbols, okay? And, uh, and it's important that we don't mix these things up, okay? So the idea of sampling is the process of selecting a sample of individuals from the population, okay? Um, you know, again, we, we want our sample to look like the population, right? And if the sample doesn't, right? If the sample is not representative of the population, it's gonna, we say that it's biased, okay? And so a biased sample may be a sample that has selected too, too few or too many individuals uh, from a particular group. So, you know, if we're, if you're dealing with a, um, a survey that, you know, perhaps is going to have um, different results based on the kind of racial demographics of the people that have been selected, you know, ideally you want your sample to look kind of like the, the population, at least with respect to racial demographics. And so, um, Ideally, your sample will have approximately the correct, um, the appropriate proportion, um, you know, of, of each kind of uh, racial group, but, but that might be difficult to achieve. So, you know, getting samples that are not biased is, is, uh, is hard to do. 
um, but it but it's a it's a goal worth striving for because you want um, your results to be um, well you want it to be represented right so one method that should okay it's n it's not guaranteed to but it should produce a random uh, representative sample is simple random sampling which is where we select individuals from the population at random one at a time and uh, you know one of the the hard parts of simple random sampling is kind of getting a list of all the individuals that it, exist in the population, okay? Uh, and again, SRS, simple random sampling, is not guaranteed to produce a representative sample. It should, but it's not guaranteed to do so, okay? All right, so that's um, that covers sampling terminology. Uh, and, uh, and now we'll talk about sampling distributions. I guess before we get in there, um, let me give you the first quiz answer for the day. First quiz answer today is E. E as an elephant. Uh, the letter E. That's um, the first quiz answer for week four, Monday. Okay, so this is the idea of a sampling distribution. Okay, when we do, when we select a random sample. The individuals that end up in our sample are random, okay? And so the sample statistic, you know, the average of your sample or the proportion in your sample, whatever statistic we're talking about is going to vary from one sample to another sample, right? So for a, let's say if we're talking about a categorical variable, okay, the sample statistic we might talk about is the sample proportion. So, um, and, you know, the, uh, the population might have a certain proportion, but when you take a random sample, what you're going to get in your random sample, uh, we expect to be close, but not exactly equal to the population proportion. All right, and so, so for example, maybe we have a coin. When you flip a coin, we know that in the long run, in the long run, it should land 50% heads, okay? We know that the probability that the coin lands heads in the long run is 50%. Um, when you flip the coin 100 times, so that's a random sample of 100 coin flips, we expect the sample proportion to be close to be to 0.5, okay? We expect out of 100 flips, we expect to get around 50 heads, but we're not expecting that it's necessarily going to be exactly equal to 50% uh, heads. It's possible that in 100 coin flips we get 53 heads, okay? 53 heads would have a proportion of 0.53. It's different from the exact probability of 50%, okay? Or maybe you get 46 heads, okay? And, and these results would not be surprising to us. We, we can just chop that up to just randomness, right? And um, and this is kind of getting at the idea that the statistic, the sample statistic, is going to vary from one random sample to another, right? If two people flip a coin 100 times, their proportion of heads is going to be, um, is going to vary, right? And so, you know, what we want to think about is the probability of these different outcomes, right? So some of these sample statistics, some of the outcomes, are going to be more likely than others, right? So when you flip a coin 100 times, you're expecting the proportion to be around 50% heads, okay, but not necessarily equal to it. But then again, some, some proportions are going to be more probable than others. So for example, with 100 coin flips, could we get a sample proportion of 45%, meaning we get 45 heads out of 100, okay? And the answer is yeah this outcome seems to be likely. Getting 45 heads out of 100 flips, that seems likely, okay? Is it possible that after 100 coin flips, you get a proportion of 40%, meaning the coin landed heads only 40 times out of 100, okay? And when we think about that, could I get you know only 40 heads out of 100, meaning I got 40 heads and 60 tails? We say, yeah, you know, that's also possible, but it doesn't seem like it's going to happen as often as getting 45 heads, right? What about a sample proportion of 35%, okay? Meaning I got 35 heads 
and 65 tails. Could that happen? I flipped the coin 100 times, 35 heads, 65 tails. And the answer is, I suppose it could happen, but that result seems pretty unlikely, okay? Getting only 35 heads and 65 tails seems pretty unlikely. What about this? Could I get a sample of sample proportion of 0.25, meaning I got 25 heads, 75 tails, right? 25 out of 100. So I don't want to say it's impossible, okay? It's 25 heads, 75 tails, 100 random coin flips. This seems like a very unlikely outcome, okay? It's not not impossible. So theoretically, yes, it's possible, but that seems um, very unlikely to happen, okay? Is it possible that with 100 coin flips, we get a sample proportion of 0 0.01? Meaning with 100 coin flips, it landed heads one time and it landed tails 99 times, okay? Um, again, theoretically, the answer is yes, it's possible, meaning like, it is possible that I get one head and then 99 tails in a row, but it seems incredibly unlikely. Like probably it would never happen in our lifetime, but you know, theoretically, we don't want to say it's impossible. Okay. So while all of these outcomes are theoretically possible, okay, just kind of intuitively, we know that the outcomes that are, that have proportions that are very far from 0 0.5, are very unlikely to happen. So, so our gut feelings tell us that getting only 1% heads or even 25% heads, these seem to be very, very unlikely, okay? Whereas getting things around 45% heads or 40% heads, those, those seem to be a lot more likely, okay? And then if we went the other way, and we talked about getting a proportion of 55% heads or 60% or 65% heads and things like that, it would follow the same pattern. Whereas the values that are close to 0.5 are more likely and the values that are far away from 0.5, like if I said, what's the pro probability of getting 99% heads? That's gonna be uh, incredibly unlikely to happen. Okay, all right, so far, does this all make sense to you guys? The idea of that certain sample statistics, certain outcomes in a random sample are more likely than others. All right, I hope that this is kind of a, a key idea in today's lesson. I hope this makes sense. And so we, uh, we summarize all of this with a sampling distribution. A sampling distribution is the distribution of all the possible sample statistics and what it will do is it shows us the probability that a random sample of a given size produces a particular value of the sample statistic, okay? So if the sample statistic we're studying is p hat, okay, then, um, which is known as the sample proportion, okay, it's, we call it the sampling distribution of p hat, okay? On the other hand, if we're talking about a, um, a sampling distribution of um, x bar. It's the, you know, if we're looking at the sample statistic being the sample mean x bar, we call this the sampling distribution of x bar, all right? So it's the distribution of all kind of the different possible sample statistics, okay? And it's always about the sample statistics. So, so it'll be the sampling distribution of p hat or the sampling distribution of x bar. You, we would never write the sampling distribution of p being the population proportion, or we would never write the sampling distribution of mu, mu being the population mean. It's always about the sample statistic. All right, so we could, we could calculate the sampling distribution of p hat ourselves, right? So, um, so what the sampling distribution is going to do is it's going to show us the probability of getting different p hat values, right? So intuitively, we know that sample proportions, like if I flip the coin 100 times, getting a sample proportion like 49% heads or 50% heads are highly likely, whereas proportions like getting only 20% heads uh, out of 100 flips uh, will be unlikely, okay? And so um, if we're taking samples of 100 using a fair coin, meaning the probability that it lands heads is 0.5, 
we can calculate the sampling distribution of p hat using the binomial distribution. So um, with the binomial distribution, the probability that the number of heads um, is x, uh, the, the probability of getting 50 and x equal to 50 is equivalent um, as calculating the probability of p hat being 0.5, right? Because our sampling distribution is technically about p hat and not x, but, but it's easy to switch from p hat to x because we've got 100 coin flips, right? So we're talking about what's the probability of getting p hat being 0.5? That's equivalent to calculating the binomial probability of getting 50 out of 100, okay? And so 50 out of 100, we would do 100 choose 50, 0.5 to the 50, 1 minus 0.5 to the 100 minus 50. Or we could use um, R's calculator, excuse me, uh, D binome, 50 comma 100 comma 0.5, we get something around 8%, right? So if, if you flip a coin 100 times, there's around an 8% probability that you would get exactly 50 heads uh, out of 100 flips or a proportion of exactly uh, p hat equal to 0.5. Okay. Um, we can find the probability of getting p hat equal to 0.49. Okay. And we do the same thing using d binome and we get something uh, just a little bit less, all right? So getting exactly 50.5, p hat being 0.5 is 0 0.07959. Getting p hat equal to 49% or 0.49 is 0 0.078, 0.07803, okay? And we can, um, we can do the calculations for all of these things, okay? So here's 0 0.07959 and 0 0.078 and, um, you know, 48% is a little bit less at 0 0.0735, 40, uh, uh, I don't know, 47% is, you know, 0 0.06659 and things like that. And so here I can use R to calculate all the probabilities from 0 to 100, okay, because those are all the different possible outcomes. Um, and, uh, and it lists them off here. And I can graph this, okay? And so this is what the graph looks like the sampling distribution for p hat, okay? So what we see is that if I flip the coin 100 times, you know, what's the probability of getting um, p hat equal to 0.5? That's the tallest at around, you know, 0 0.07959, so very close to 8%, okay? And then getting 40, 49% or 51% also has a high probability getting 48, and 52, 47, and 53 percent, so on and so forth, okay? Uh, so we see the values near 0.5 have a high probability, and as we move away from 0.5, say down to 0.4, okay, it's uh, not a zero probability, okay? So it's a, it's a much lower probability, but, um, but it's not zero, and um, Um, as we get farther and farther away from 0.5, we are, um, the, the probability drops down significantly. So the probability of getting 30% heads, okay, p hat equal to 0.3 is, uh, is pretty close to zero, okay? Probability of getting 70% heads also pretty close to zero, okay? And then, you know, also pretty close to zero of getting, you know, 1% or 99% heads. Okay, so I just write kind of in summary, the plot confirms what we know intuitively and that it is likely to get values of p hat that are close to 0.5 and less likely to get values of p hat that are far away from 0.5, right? And if we look at this, the shape of this looks like a normal distribution. It's technically, it's not technically a normal distribution because it's discrete in that as far as the proportions that we can get, you can only get a certain number of proportions. The, um, with 100 coin flips, you're either going to get, you know, 50% heads or 51% heads. It's impossible to get 50 and a half percent heads because you're either going to get 51 heads out of 100 or 50 heads out of 100. You're not going to get 50 and a half. Um, okay. So, um, 
this is summarized a bit in something called the central limit theorem, all right? And the central limit theorem says that this sampling distribution that we've created back here, okay, which technically we calculated using the binomial distribution, the central limit theorem says this sampling distribution, we can approximate it. We can approximate it using the normal distribution. It's not exactly equal to the normal distribution, but it can be approximated, which is gonna make our life easier. And so um, when you approximate it using the normal distribution, you need to specify the mean, you need to specify the standard deviation, okay? So the mean, the mean of our normal distribution is gonna be equal to the population proportion. So that, that is, we say mu is equal to P. So if we're talking about flipping a coin, our, the proportion in our population is 0.5, and we're effectively creating a normal distribution where the mean is 0.5, okay? The standard deviation is found using this, uh, this formula here, which is gonna be P times one minus P divided by N, okay? This, the standard deviation of our sampling distribution. If this gets a special name known as the standard error. So in order to kind of distinguish, it's, it's the standard deviation, but it's the standard deviation of a sampling distribution. So to kind of uh, make sure that, that we know that we're talking about the standard deviation of a sampling distribution, we, we often call it the standard error, the SE, okay? And so if you plug in the numbers that we have, so we plug in P being 0.5, because we're dealing with a fair coin that lands heads 50% of the time, and we're flipping the coin 100 times, n is 100, then our uh, sampling distribution can be approximated with the normal distribution, where mean mu is equal to 0.5, and sigma is equal to, when you do the calculations, turns out to be 0.05, okay? So we have a normal distribution where the mean is 0.5 and sigma is 0.05. And so here I am, and I'm plotting the normal distribution with those properties, and we get that's in this dotted blue line. And what we see is that the dotted blue line lines up very, very uh, well with the, um, the actual sampling distribution. The sampling distribution is given by the vertical lines. Those are the, you know, that's the exact probability of getting p hat being 0.5, p hat being 0.51, and so on and so forth. And we see there's almost a, a perfect match between these, um, these two things, okay? So if we look at the uh, kind of the, the equations in the central limit theorem, the, um, the size of the sample n shows up in our standard deviation here, okay? So with n equal to 100, our p hat is point, uh, has a, normal distribution or is approximately normal with a standard error of 0 0.05, what happens if I reduce the size of our sample, okay? If I change n in our sampling distribution, right? So what if I flip the coin only 50 times out of 50 times, okay? Instead of 100 times, I'm only gonna flip the coin 50 times. Okay, what happens to our sampling distribution? Well, what happens is that this n drops down to 50, and when I do the calculations, and I do 0.5 times 0.5, I'm dividing by a smaller number, so my standard error gets bigger, okay? So instead of dividing by 100 here, I'm dividing by a smaller number, I'm dividing by 50, and so that means the resulting standard error, the standard, uh, standard deviation of my sampling distribution gets bigger. So a larger standard deviation means that normal distribution gets more spread out. Okay, and so this is what the resulting sampling distribution looks like. So if I go back a few slides, this is the sampling distribution when n is 100, and this is the sampling distribution when n is equal to 50, okay? So, um, you know, we also see there's, there's still a pretty, pretty good uh, matchup between the, um, the vertical lines, which are the actual sampling distribution with our uh, approximation using the normal distribution, okay? So one thing you'll note is that here, the lines are closer together and the lines are more spread out over here, okay? And the reason for that is we are looking at 
the vertical lines represent the actual outcomes that we can get. So when you flip the coin only 50 times, you can only get something like um, 25 heads out of 50 or 26 heads out of 50 or 27 heads out of 50 or something like that. It is not possible to get something in between. So if you get 25 heads out of 50, that's a proportion of p hat of 0.5. If you get 26 heads out of 50, that's a proportion of 0.52, okay? Or, or I, here I went the other way. Uh, if you get 24 heads out of 50, then you, your p hat is 0.48, 23 heads is 0.46, okay? And it's impossible to get a proportion of 0.47 because in order to get a proportion of 0.47, the coin needs to have landed heads 23.5 times, which is not possible. It, it's only possible to get a whole number of outcomes. So, so we will never get a p hat of 0.47. So that's why um, the vertical lines that we see in our sampling distribution are, are more spaced out because we can't get the values that are in between. Okay, so um, as we change n, and I'm gonna continue changing n in the upcoming slides, we're gonna see kind of the vertical lines appear in, uh, in different locations, and that corresponds to kind of the different um, outcomes that are possible as far as sample proportions. Okay, so I just kind of wanna show you, you know, what happens if we flip the coin only 40 times? What happens here is that, um, again, with, with n, as n gets smaller, the um, standard error continues to get larger, okay? And let's, uh, I got a question here is, question came in and said, is the fact that you can only get whole number of values true for all sampling distributions or just for this example with the coin? So um, this thing where we can only get a whole number such as 24 times or 23 times, this applies only to what we uh, to categorical variables where we're dealing with a proportion. So when you're talking about the proportion of, you know, how often it landed heads, or if we're talking about say people, and you say, you know, who are you going to vote for? Are you going to vote for this particular candidate? So just we'll just anonymously use John Q. Public. Who's going to vote for John Q. Public? That number is only going to be a whole number, right? As far as um, how many people are going to vote for something. Um, and, and so when you do the kind of the sampling distribution, you're only going to get certain outcomes. Um, but then if we're talking about a continuous variable, such as, um, you know, how tall is somebody, how much money does somebody have, that, that's going to, that can take on the decimal values and it's not limited to just whole numbers. So, um, so it depends on the variable is the, uh, the answer. Okay, so if we uh, only do 40 flips, okay, rather than 50, then our sampling distribution gets a, um, a larger standard error. It goes up a, a little bit, and, uh, and the difference is subtle, okay? Here it is uh, in, on slide 31, and then if we jump over to slide 35, this is what it looks like, okay? So just uh, it's spread out a little bit more, okay? If I reduce it for n equal to 30, it spreads out a little bit further. Our standard deviation gets bigger. With n equal to 20, it spreads out even more, okay? With uh, a much um, bigger standard deviation. At n equal to 15, um, it spreads out quite a bit. At n equal to 10, um, you know, at, with only 10 flips, okay, our spread is a, is a lot higher, okay? And when n is down to say 10 flips, you'll notice that now we're getting a little bit of mismatch between the dotted line and the vertical lines, okay? So the vertical lines were calculated using the binomial distribution, and I would say that's the true sampling distribution. And what we've been saying is that, you know, this, um, the normal distribution, which is the blue dotted line, does a pretty good job of approximating this, okay? And I would say that's pretty true for most of these cases, but then as n gets um, smaller and smaller, so like n equal to 10, n equal to eight, you'll notice there's, uh, there's a, the, uh, the line and the dotted line 
the solid line, vertical solid line and the dotted line uh, don't quite line up. There's a little bit of mismatch right here, a little mismatch right there. Seems to line up pretty well right there, okay? But, um, but they're, they're a little bit off, okay? And as n gets uh, even lower to eight, you know, it gets more and more spread out. But these, uh, the mismatch, you know, seems to grow a little bit uh, even more, okay? And so um, to kind of just summarize what, what we saw here, what I'm gonna say is that as our sample size decreases, what we saw was that the spread of the sampling distribution increasing, that, that the, um, the proportions that we could get um, get wider, um, the spread gets wider and wider, right? Okay, and that makes sense because if we look at the, uh, the formula that we're using to um, create our approximation, n is in our denominator, so as n gets smaller, our standard error gets bigger, okay? But it also makes intuitive sense, right? If we just think about this, right? If what we say, um, you know, whenever you flip the coin, you're expecting something around 50% heads, okay? Uh, and as you deviate from 50% heads, okay, um, it's gonna be easier to deviate from 50% heads when you have um, fewer coin, coin flips, right? So if you flip the coin 100 times, it would be a little bit surprising to get a proportion of 30% heads because that means you only got 30 heads out of 100 coin flips, okay? But if you flip the coin only 10 times, it's not as hard to get a proportion of 30% heads because to get 30% heads in 10 flips, you only need to get, you'd have to get three heads out of 10, okay? So with 100 flips, we're expecting 50 heads, we're expecting 50%, we're expecting 50 heads, and for you, in order for you to get 30 heads, you need to get, you need to fall 20 heads short, okay? You have to, you have to get only 30 out of 100, so 30 is 20 less than 50, okay? And that's, that seems like uh, unlikely to happen. On the other hand, when you're flipping it only 10 times, you're expecting five heads. Um, and in order to get 30%, you'd have to get three heads, okay? And so three versus five, that's only a difference of two heads, okay? And so it seems, it doesn't seem that hard for uh, just, just by random chance, you got a, a few uh, coin flips came out a little bit weird. And to get three heads out of 10, um, doesn't seem all that strange versus getting 30 heads out of 100, okay? Uh, and then the other thing we, I wanted to point out was that as n gets low, the normal curve no longer does a good job, right? We get some mismatch between the, uh, the normal curve and the dotted blue and the actual uh, sampling distribution, okay? So, um, so when n is less than 20, these, these lines don't do as, as good of a job and it gets more pronounced as n gets lower and lower. Okay, um, so that, that was us messing around with n. Um, what happens if we mess around with p, okay? So p is the proportion that the coin will land heads, okay? So, so far we've been dealing with a fair coin. What happens if we have this kind of magical coin that's not fair, okay? And I don't know if such a coin exists in real life, but what if we have a coin that when you flip it, it doesn't land heads 50% of the time, it lands heads, say, 60% of the time. What if this proportion is 0.6, if we flip the coin a bunch of times, what does our sampling distribution look like, okay? So let's say we're gonna flip the coin 50 times and P is 0.6, okay? When we apply the uh, central limit theorem, okay, we expect our sampling distribution to be centered at 0.6 and the standard, standard deviation or the standard error is gonna be P times one minus P divided by N and we get something like this, okay? And this is what the picture looks like, okay? So this time the sampling distribution is centered at 0.6 rather than 0.5. And so what we see is that the sampling distribution has kind of been shifted from being centered at 0.5, it's been shifted um, to the right where it's now centered at 0.6, okay? Um, if I change P to be 0.7, it shifts even more, right? So from 0.6 to 
to p equal to 0.7, it shifts higher. At p equal to 0.8, it shifts even higher. At p equal to 0.9, it shifts higher. And what we're noticing, okay, is it, um, take a look at how the lines line up, the vertical lines and the dotted line. Um, there's, uh, there's a little bit of mismatch here. And as I push p to be higher, you know, to 0.8, okay, the, uh, the mismatch gets more pronounced. At p equal to 0.9, there's quite a bit of mismatch, okay? At 0.95, I would say there's a lot of mismatch, okay? Um, between the vertical lines and the normal approximation. Uh, and here, you know, we're just pushing it even more extreme. So if the coin was, you know, super unfair in that it lands heads 97% of the time, okay? where it lands heads 97% of the time and we're flipping it 50 times, either we're gonna get it lands heads 50 times out of 50, which is 100%, or 49, which is 98%, or 48 times, which is 96%. So this is what the um, sampling distribution ends up looking like, okay? Uh, and then if I go the other way, starting at P equal to 0.5, it's centered at 0.5, if I push if our coin is unfair and it lands heads only 40% of the time, this is what it looks like. And as I keep shifting it down, the uh, the sampling distribution kind of slides over, right? So um, as it goes, it just kind of slides over. And again, what we see is that when P gets quite low, there's quite a bit of mismatch between what the um, normal distribution looks like and what the um, actual sampling distribution which should look like, okay? So, you know, as P changes, the center of the sampling distribution shifts around to match wherever P is, okay? But then as P also gets close to zero or one, the normal curve does not do a good job approximating the true probabilities, all right? So, so in our, our examples, we saw the vertical lines don't match when P became less than say 20% or P got greater than 80%, that's when things start to go um, go off a little bit, okay? So to kind of summarize all of this, we're gonna say that the central limit theorem, what this says is that when we're looking at the sampling distribution of P hat, it can be approximated with the normal distribution um, with me, the mean equal to P and the standard error equal to P times one minus P over N, okay? But in order for that normal approximation to look like the sampling distribution, there's a few things that, that had to be true, okay? One was N needs to be big. So when we had N that was too small, it didn't do a good job uh, of, of an approximation. And then the other one is that um, we don't want our P to be close, too close to one or P to be too close to zero, right? So, because if it got too close to zero, this dotted line doesn't do a good approximation. If it got too close to one on the other side, it doesn't do a good approximation. So we're gonna say, um, so this is kind of the rule that we've come up with, is that n times p have to be greater than or equal to 10, and n times one minus p has to also be greater than or equal to 10. So either n has to be big, so if p is like close to zero, then n has to be huge, or you know, if n is small, then, um, then p has to be has to be big, okay, in order for this to be the case, all right? And this also just helps avoid the other extreme, right? If P is too close to one, then N has to be really big or, you know, or if N is smaller, then P can't be too close to one, okay? And so we kind of combine these in this uh, statement here. Um, the other conditions for the central limit theorem is that, you know, we've got to assume that our sample has been selected randomly and independently, okay? And this is known as the random independent condition. Okay, and then there's one thing, and, and, um, and it's that the probability P has to remain constant for all the individuals, okay? So if you're gonna, um, uh, this is not something I talked about, but if you sample without replacement, uh, you don't wanna sample too much, okay? Uh, so the rule of thumb is that don't sample over 10% of the population, because if you do that, that could affect the, the P of the remaining things. So if you think of a, like a deck of cards, in a deck of cards, there's, you know, 
52 cards and you start off with 26 red cards and 26 black cards. Okay, and so the first card you draw out of the deck, there's a 50% probability that that card's gonna be black, okay? Um, after, let's say you draw a card and it's, it's a black card, then what remains in the deck is 26 red cards and 20, 25 black cards, okay? And so your probability of getting a red or black card is no longer 50%, it's ever so slightly off. So the probability of getting a black card would, is now only 25 out of 51, okay? And, um, and what we're generally, the kind of the rule of thumb is that as, you know, in the beginning, the difference of drawing one or two cards out has, has a very small impact on what remains, okay? The difference between 26 out of 52 versus 25 out of 51 is a, is, is, is a small difference. And so, um, so, so we say, you know, it's not that big of a deal. But once you start drawing, say, more than five or six cards out of the deck, what remains in the deck could be significantly influenced by what cards you have in your hand. And so, um, so kind of our guideline is that if you sample without replacement, okay, and you sample over 10%, then that, that could affect the peak, okay? If you're sampling with replacement, so like uh, you start off with 26 red cards, 25 black cards, you draw a card, let's say it's a red card, and then you put it back in the deck, so that's sampling with replacement, so that every time when you draw a random card of the deck, there's always gonna be 26 red and 20, uh, 26 black cards, then, then it doesn't matter. You could take a sample as big as you want. You don't have to worry about P changing because you're, you're sampling with replacement. So when you're flipping a coin, every single time you flip the coin, there's uh, a 50% chance of heads or tails. So we don't have to worry about, we don't have to worry about P changing here. All right, is that okay? I hope. Let me give you your um, second quiz answer for today. Second quiz answer for today is A as an apple. A as an apple, that's gonna be uh, your second quiz answer for today. And then why don't we go ahead and take a, a five minute break here and, uh, and we'll come back and we'll, uh, we'll finish out the, uh, the rest of the chapter. So we'll go ahead and take, uh, take five minutes. Uh, and again, second quiz answer for the day is A as an apple. All right, we'll, uh, we'll see you in a, in a moment here. Okay, a uh, question came in. It says, can we still use the empirical rule for sampling distributions? Uh, yes, the um, empirical rule applies to anything that follows a normal distribution. And so if you know that your sampling distribution follows the normal distribution, uh, which, uh, which we can say with the central limit theorem, then you can use the empirical rule. So we can, um, so we'll, um, we'll actually uh, do that in a, in a moment here. Okay, I wanted to show you, uh, I've got this little, uh, I hope you guys can see, um, kind of this toy here. And, um, and this is a demonstration of basically the, uh, the central limit theorem and how the uh, uh, binomial distribution can be approximated with a normal distribution, okay? All right, and so what, uh, what this device is, is there's a whole bunch of little um, black metal, or not, uh, not black metal beads, but just uh, tiny little metal beads here. And, um, and I'm gonna flip this over and they're all gonna go into this, uh, this funnel at the top, okay? And when I flip this over, what's gonna happen is the beads, um, uh, fall out from the middle here, okay? And then they hit uh, a series of pegs, okay? Every time they hit a peg, they can hit, um, they can bounce either to the left or bounce to the right, okay? With approximately a 50% probability of bouncing to the left and to the 50% uh, to the right, okay? And so it's possible, uh, and then after they hit that, there's another row of pegs and another row of pegs and another row of pegs. Okay. And so it's possible for uh, a bead to end up all the way, uh, all the way to the, uh, the edge, but in order for that to happen, it has to bounce right, 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 right. After every single, uh, every single peg row, it kind of has to bounce to the right. Okay. Um, it could also end up over here 
But in order for that to happen, at every single peg row, it has to bounce left, 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 all the way to the edge, okay? Whereas ending up in the middle, there's lots of ways it can go. It can go right, 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 left, 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 right, 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 left, right, left, right, left, right, 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 left, left, right, left, things like that, okay? So there's lots of paths for it to kind of end up uh, in the middle. And so, um, so what we see is that basically going left or right is kind of like a binomial distribution, okay? And, or, you know, binomial situation where it's either only two outcomes of either going left or to the right. And then, um, you know, we've got however many rows there are, that's, the, that's kind of the N that you have. And, uh, and there's a whole bunch of uh, beads. And so what we see is that um, by, by looking at a whole bunch of these things, uh, it's gonna end up kind of matching the, uh, um, we're gonna get a binomial distribution down here. And we're gonna see that binomial distribution can be approximated with within uh, the normal curve, which is, which is shown in yellow here. And so I'll, I'll do this a few times here, and I hope I can uh, kind of keep this steady. And we get, uh, we get something that looks like the, uh, the normal curve. And, uh, and every time you do it, you get something a little bit different. But, uh, but again, uh, you get something that looks uh, a lot like the, uh, the normal distribution just from the, just from uh, kind of the random falling, which, uh, which I thought was kind of a neat, uh, just kind of a neat, uh, neat thing to, uh, to observe here. Okay, let me go back uh, to sharing uh, my slides here. Okay, and um, we'll, uh, we'll go on. Okay, all right, and so, you know, the, the whole reason why we bother with the, uh, the sampling distribution is that we want to be able to apply it and it allows us to begin uh, doing uh, statistical inference here, okay? So, um, so, so one question, well, we can just start off by just kind of applying the, uh, the central limit theorem and we could ask a question like this. We could say, let's flip a coin 50 times. What's the probability that we get a proportion of 60% heads or more, right? So what's the probability that I'm gonna get 60% heads or more? Okay, and so what we can do is, um, we can kind of write this out mathematically. What is this question? We want to know what's the probability that p hat, the sample proportion, the sample proportion p hat ends up being 60% or more, okay? We have n equal to 50 and the probability of getting heads for any one flip is 0.5, okay? Um, and so we can use the central limit theorem because the conditions are met in that n times p is uh, 25 and n times one minus p is also 25 and both of those are bigger than 10. Uh, each coin flip is random and independent and the big population doesn't apply because we are not sampling without replacement, okay? So the big population only applies when you're, you know, sampling, drawing individuals and not kind of putting them back. All right, so when, you, when we do the uh, central limit theorem, we can say p hat can be approximated with a normal distribution with mu equal to 0.5 and sigma or the standard error equal to 0 0.0707. And when you calculate your z-score, you get, you do x minus mu divided by the standard deviation. So we wanna know what's the probability of getting 60% heads. The mean is 0.5. Our standard deviation is 0 0.0707. So we get a z-score of uh, about 1.41. And we go to the table and we say, well, what's the probability that z ends up being greater than or equal to 1.41? Because we're asking, what's the probability of getting 60% uh, heads or more? Okay, and so when you look that up, we're gonna do one minus this probability of 0.9207. You look up uh, 1.41 in the table and you get 0.9207. So you do one minus that and you get something around 8%, 7.0793. So if we flip a coin 50 times, there's around an 88% probability that you're gonna get 60% heads or more, okay? 60% heads or more. And again, this is an approximate answer because we're using, um, 
the normal distribution as an approximation. It's a pretty good approximation, but it's not exactly the same. All right. Um, I think in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this uh, your turn problem. Okay, you can go through it. Uh, I, I do recommend that you uh, you go through these and and uh, and try these out. So, but I'm going to kind of uh, skip ahead here. Okay. Um, let's talk about confidence intervals. Okay, and so here's the. Um, Here's kind of a, a situation that you know we might find ourselves in, in that we want to estimate, we want to make a conclusion about the population even though we've only observed a sample. Okay, so that's what um, that's what we want to do. We want to make a conclusion about the population based on a sample, right? And so, uh, you know, what we did in the previous problem is that we said, you know, the we understood the population. We knew that when we flip a coin, that when we flip a coin, that it's going to land heads 50% of the time. Okay. But on the other hand, we might have a question about the population. Okay. And I'm just making up numbers here. This I don't, I didn't actually do a study on Netflix or anything like this. But we might say, like, what what proportion of people in the population subscribe to Netflix? Okay. So what proportion of people subscribe to Netflix? And um, and we might want to uh, to answer that by you know taking a, a random sample of people, right? So if we observe a random sample, what can we say about the population? So let's say we survey 100 randomly selected people. Okay, we survey 100 randomly selected people. Maybe we get 30 people. We find 30 people pay for Netflix subscriptions, right? So these people are the subscribers. Um, so 30 out of 100 um, pay for Netflix. What does this say about the proportion in the population? Okay, so in my sample of 100, 30 people pay for Netflix. Okay, what proportion of people in the entire population um, subscribe to Netflix then? Okay, or pay for Netflix? So, um, what we don't know now is we don't know the proportion that exists in the population. We know that our random sample ended up being 30%. But we don't know if my random sample ended up higher than the population or if my random sample ended up lower than the population, right? Which is different from this situation back here when we were flipping the coin. We know when we flip a coin, we should get 50% heads and we want to know what's the probability that I get something like 60% in my sample. This time we flipped it around and we're saying in your sample, we observed 30%. What does that say about the population? Could the population be, say, 25% um, Netflix subscribers and you just happen to get a sample where you got 30%? Or could the population be 35% Netflix subscribers and you got a proportion in your sample that was lower, like 30%? Could the population actually even be 50% Netflix subscribers, but your sample just happened to be really low at only 30%? Um, this is kind of what we want to know. We want to say, what can we say about the proportion in the population um, that subscribe to Netflix, even though we've only observed one sample where it's 30%, 30 out of 100. Okay, so, so a couple questions is, you know, is the proportion in the population equal to 0.3? And the answer is no, not necessarily, but we do expect the population proportion P to be kind of close to 30%. And, um, and I'm going to kind of leave it at, you know, maybe we can create a range of values that express what we think that popula population proportion P could be, okay? So our P hat, the observed P hat is 30 out of 100 or 0.3, and we want to know what can we say about P, the population proportion. All right, so put that, put this thought about Netflix and what proportion in the population subscribed to Netflix if this is the data you observed. And, uh, and I'm gonna pre pre present you know, kind of a silly analogy here. Okay, so this is my beautiful artwork and it's a picture of a dog uh, standing on a football field, okay? And this dog is located at the 30 yard line on the football field. Okay, so we take, we, we've taken a picture of this dog we're looking at the dog in the picture, 
He's located at the 30 yard line. And, uh, and then we're informed that the dog's owner is also in the picture, okay? So the dog's owner is also in the picture, except the dog's owner is an invisible person, okay? Owner is invisible, and the leash that the owner is using is also invisible, <laughs> okay? All right, so this is kind of, again, silly analogy here, but we're saying the owner is, uh, is in the picture, but invisible as well, okay? And so the question is, where is the owner? Where is the owner, right? Do we know where the owner is? Okay, and the answer is we don't know where the owner is, okay? We do not know the exact location of the owner, but we do know that the owner's holding a leash and therefore we expect the owner to be close to the dog, okay? We know that the owner can't be super far away from the dog because the owner and the dog are, you know, kind of linked to each other via this invisible elastic leash, okay? So even though we don't know exactly where the owner is, we know owner has to be kind of close to the dog. All right, so um, we know some facts in, about the behavior of the dog, okay? And these are the facts, okay? In general, the dog likes to stay close to the owner, okay? The dog doesn't like to stray too far away and pull against the elastic leash. And in fact, we can summarize this, all right? 68% of the time, the dog stays within one yard of the owner. 95% of the time, the dog stays within two yards of the owner. And 99.7% of the time, the dog stays within three yards of the owner. Okay, <laughs> where did I get these numbers from? Okay, yeah, these, these numbers come from the uh, empirical rule, right? Like these, these look familiar, I think. And so what we can say is that because we know the behavior of the dog, okay, if the dog is seen to be at the 30, 30 yard line, we can be 95% confident that the owner is between 28 and 32, right? Because we're kind of reversing our understanding of the behavior of the dog, okay? So we know that wherever the owner is, the dog, 95% of the time, the dog stays within two yards of the owner. So if we see the dog located at the 30 yard line, we can be 95% confident that the owner is maybe uh, between 28 and 32, okay? Maybe the, it's possible is, could the owner be at the 33 yard line? Yeah, could be. Okay, the owner could be at the 33 yard line, but that would be a little bit surprising to us because that means this picture was taken in kind of one of those rare instances where the dog strayed more than two yards away from the owner, right? So sometimes that happens, you know, sometimes the dog does go more than two yards away from the owner, but it doesn't happen very often, but it could happen and, and it, it is possible that this picture was taken in one of those rare moments where the dog happened to be uh, you know, kind of far away from the owner, okay? But most of the time, the dog stays close to the owner within two yards of the owner. So when we see the dog at the 30, we can say, you know, I'm 95% confident that the owner is between 20 and 32, okay? All right, so this is the, um, this is kind of the, uh, the analogy here. Um, oh, so yeah. Okay, this is what I was just saying. The owner could be at 32.5 or even 33.5, but that would be surprising because that means the picture was taken uh, at one of the rare times where the dog chose to be more than two or three yards from the owner, okay? All right, and so um, the picture with the dog with the invisible owner is similar to having an observed sample with a proportion, right? So we can see the sample proportion and we're trying to make conclusions about the population proportion. Okay, so like the invisible owner, the location of the population proportion P is unknown to us. So we don't know what the proportion in the population is, okay? But like the dog that we can see, the visible dog, we are able to know the exact location of the sample proportion P hat, okay? So we are able to know the sample's proportion P hat, okay? And uh, and we know that the sampling distribution can be approximated with the normal distribution, okay? And that means p hat generally remains close to p, right? So from the 
Uh, earlier today, we were looking at the sampling distribution of p hat. And we said, you know, the sampling distribution shows that p hat generally remains close to p, okay, which is like the behavior of the dog, okay. So 95% of the time, p hat will be within two standard errors of p, okay, because we know um, p hat follows the normal distribution. And because we know the behavior of p hat, just like we know the behavior of the dog, we can say we're 95% confident that p is within you know, approximately two standard errors of p hat, that the population proportion, which is unknown to us, we can be confident is within two standard errors of p hat, the sample proportion that we did observe, okay? And that's because it's entirely based on the properties of the sampling distribution, which say that um, p hat follows a normal distribution where it's centered at p. And so if we know where p hat is located, we can be confident that, that the mean that kind of determines where p hat ends up, we can be confident that p, the population proportion, is close to the p hat that we observe. All right, let me um, pause here and just kind of make sure everybody understands. So give me, um, you guys can give me a little yes check mark if, uh, if you're following along or throw a question in the chat if, uh, if this does not make sense or give me a no, because um, this is, this is going to be a, uh, an important idea that, uh, that we use uh, going forward, okay? Okay, and uh, I, I guess I'll go ahead and give you the third quiz answer for today. Um, so the, uh, the last quiz answer for today is C as in cat. I hope you guys still stick around for the rest of the lecture. <laughs> Even though I've given you the uh, the last quiz answer, C as in cat um, is the uh, the third quiz answer um, uh, for today. Okay, and so um, so we are going to um, take that and um, and apply this, and just and we're going to use some mathematical numbers. Okay. All right, so when we make a 95% confidence interval for P, the population proportion, based on P hat, this is what we're going to create. Uh, can I repeat the quiz question answer? Yeah. Last quiz question answer for today is C. C as in cat or California. Okay. All right. So the... Um, when we make a 95% confidence interval, it's gonna be uh, this. The, uh, the second quiz, wait, what, hold on. Can you repeat the quiz question? And what was the second quiz answer? Okay, second quiz answer was A as an apple. <laughs> All right, uh, A as an apple, second quiz answer. Okay. Uh, we're 95% confident that uh, P is between, uh, and we're going to go P hat minus uh, basically two standard errors. We actually use 1.96, 1.96 times the standard error, and P hat plus 1.96 times the standard error, right? So, so if we observe P hat to be 30% and the standard error is, say, uh, you know, 2% or whatever, we're going to go two standard errors down and two standard errors up. Okay, so uh, we use 1.96 because it technically gives us um, more accurate results than using the number two. So the empirical rule says, you know, about 95% are within two, two standard errors. Technically, the, uh, a more accurate answer uh, number is 1.96. Okay, so we'll, we'll use that. Okay. Um, and then we, uh, what we're going to use to calculate the standard error is we're going to use p hat Okay, to estimate the standard error, because we don't know the actual value of the population proportion p. So we don't actually, so the standard error, if we went back to the um, central limit theorem slide, the standard error is actually p times one minus p over n, but we don't actually know what p is, so we have to use p hat as an estimate, okay? So we'll use p hat to, uh, to calculate the standard error because we don't know the actual value of p. All right, and so this is how we make a 95% confidence interval. Um, you can make other confidence intervals, okay? Um, this number 1.96 is known as the critical value Z star, okay? 
So if you, uh, if you, you know, when you read your textbook, they talk about the critical value. And depending on how, what kind of confidence level you want for your confidence interval, you're going to use a different critical value. So if you want a higher confidence level, you're going to actually use a larger critical value. Your 99% confidence interval will have a critical value of 2.58. If you're um, if you're okay with a lower confidence level, say like 90% or something, then your critical value will change to be uh, 1.645 and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, I would put like a star on this page, or I guess just <laughs> jot down somewhere <laughs> that, um, that the critical values are on this page. It's also in your textbook. There's also a, a table in your textbook that looks exactly like this, okay? But, uh, but these numbers are gonna be important. So, you know, in future quizzes and exams, uh, I'll ask you to make a confidence interval, and I might give you a confidence level that's not exactly um, that's not 95% or whatever, and, uh, and you'll want this table to kind of make sure you, you pick the correct critical value there, okay? Okay, and so um, the, to generalize, we can say the lower and upper bounds of the confidence interval will be p hat minus z times the critical uh, times the standard error to p hat plus z star times the standard error. Okay, and, and we can combine the minus and the plus into this. So we have p hat plus or minus, that's what this symbol represents. It's a plus and a minus combined. So p hat plus or minus z star times the standard error. Okay, this quantity z star times the standard error is known as the margin of error. Okay, and you might have seen something like that in uh, survey results. It might say um, this candidate you know, has this favorability rating with a margin of error of 2% or something like that, right? So-and-so has a net approval rating of, you know, 40% with a margin of error of 2%, okay? Which means that number could be anywhere from, that we're confident that that number is somewhere between 38 and 42% or something like that, okay? And that, that plus or minus 2%, okay, is calculated by doing Z star times the standard error. All right, so let's let's work through an example here, right? So uh, we said we took a sa sample of 100 randomly selected people, and in the sample, 30% um, 30 people paid for Netflix. Okay, and so we want to say what can we say about the proportion in the population that subscribed to Netflix? All right, so we're going to make a 95% confidence interval, and uh, and let's go. Let's just work through this, right? So our p hat is 0 0.3, 30 divided by 100 is 0 0.3. And I'm gonna just kind of plug in my numbers. So if I do p hat minus 1.96 times this, this will create my lower bound. So 0 0.3 minus 1.96 times the square root of 0 0.3 times 0 0.7 over 100. And so this takes me down to 21%. And the upper bound is gonna be this, takes me up to around 39%, okay? So if I round off to, you know, three decimal places, I get 21.0 and basically 39.0. And I would say, based on the results of my survey, I am 95% confident that the proportion of Netflix subscribers in the population is between 21% and 39%. Okay, that's, so I would say I'm 95% confident that the proportion of Netflix subscribers in the population is between 21 and 39%. Okay, so... Um, but just like the dog and the invisible owner, we're not guaranteeing that the population proportion, that the uh, this invisible value that's unknown to us, that we're not guaranteeing that it's definitely between 21 and 39 percent. We're just saying I'm pretty confident that it's going to be between 29 and 39 percent, 21 and 39 percent, because because we know the behavior of p hat. Most of the time, p hat is within you know, two standard errors of the, uh, of P. And because P hat's at 30%, I'm pretty confident that P is, you know, kind of two standard errors away or less. Uh, and that's what we have, right? So, so there's a few questions that we could ask based on 
our resulting confidence interval. So based on the uh, results from above, okay, we said I'm 95% confident that the proportion of Netflix subscribers is between 21 and 39%, right? That's what we're saying. It's between 21 and 39%. So we could ask, do we have evidence that the proportion P is different from 20%? So are we, um, is the uh, proportion of Netflix subscribers different from 20%? And the answer here is yes, okay? 20% is not between these values of 21 and 39%, okay? And so this, this range of values, 21 to 39%, these, this is kind of our range of plausible values that we believe um, P is inside this range, okay? 20% is outside of that. So we would say, you know, I'm pretty confident, we have evidence, we're, we're confident that P is a value that's different from 20%, okay? Maybe it's 25%, maybe it's 33%, whatever it is, we're, we're confident that P is something other than 20%. Okay, um, do we have evidence that the proportion is different from 25%, okay? And the answer to this one is no. 25% is in between 21 and 39%, right? 25 is between the, uh, the ends of our confidence interval. So we would consider that to be uh, a plausible value. Uh, we, we could believe that the proportion in the population is 25%. And so we're, we're not allowed to say, okay, we, we won't say that we have evidence that P is a value different from 25%, okay? Um, and so someone could then ask, do we have evidence that the proportion is, is 25%? Is P equal to 25%, all right? So we're saying that it's not different from 25%, okay? We don't have evidence that P is different from 25%, okay? But at the same time, we cannot say that P is exactly 25% either, okay? So this, this is a little bit frustrating uh, for people who are new to statistics, okay? So when, you know, the, the conclusions that we make as statisticians are often uh, people find them to be unsatisfying because, um, because there's always so much uncertainty around it, right? So we're, we can say, um, we won't say that it's different from 25%, but we're also not gonna say that it is 25%, okay? The confidence interval um, can never provide evidence that P is equal to some exact value, okay? 25% is a plausible value, like we could believe that it's 25%, but at the same time, we cannot say that it definitely is 25%, okay? And so, um, so this is what we have. Okay, another question says, these conclusions of yes or no, of like having evidence and, and not having evidence, um, would change if we had a different confidence interval, like a 68 or 99.7% confidence interval. Uh, yes, and I, and I will show you um, examples of that in, in just a moment, okay? But um, so, so I, I intentionally write all of these out, these questions that are similar with, you know, kind of these ambiguous answers, because these are the appropriate things that you can say based on the confidence interval. And, uh, you know, and, wh and one of the things that, um, you know, bother me because I'm so pedantic about some of this stuff is that, you know, when, when people report on confidence intervals and then they, they make conclusions that the confidence intervals don't um, justify, right? So, so, you might get a confidence interval like this and people will say, you know, therefore, you know, we can say that P is equal to 25%. No, you can't. You cannot say that P is 25%. At the same time, you cannot say that it's different from 25%, all right? All we can say with this confidence interval is we can say, I'm pretty confident that it's not 40%. I'm pretty confident that it's not 20%. Or I'm pretty confident that it's not something outside of the range. But anything inside this range, 21 to 39% could be, but it, might not necessarily be exactly that either. Okay, so, um, you know, let's talk about what would happen if we change the level of confidence. So here we created a 95% confidence interval and, and we use the value 1.96, okay? Um, if we want to create a higher confidence interval, uh, interval with a higher confidence level, what's gonna result 
is that we have to make the interval wider, okay? So, you know, think of, let's go, you know, forgive me, but we'll go back to the invisible man analogy, okay? And let's say, you know, we see the dog at the 30 yard line and let's say we want to like try to catch the invisible man with a net, okay? If you want to be more confident that your net is going to capture, catch the invisible man, what do you want to be, what do you want to do is that you want to throw a bigger, you want to cast a bigger net if you want to be more confident, okay? But it's also possible that, you know, casting a bigger net, you know, maybe just requires a bigger net. Having a wider interval is a, you know, is a little bit less useful in, in practical senses. And so if you want to, um, on the other hand, you can have a smaller net, okay, but you will be less confident about capturing that invisible man, okay? And so in the, in the same way, um, if you want to be more confident that your interval contains P, you have to make your interval wider, okay? If you want a narrower interval, which, which is usually more useful, it comes at the cost of giving up confidence, okay? So, you know, what do you mean a narrower interval is more useful? Um, well, let's say you wanted to make a budget for next, uh, next month, okay? <laughs> let's say you run a business and you wanted to make a budget for next month, and, uh, and it's going to be based on the sales that you make from your website or something, right? And, uh, and you say, well, um, so your accountant asks, uh, you know, how much, how much money will you make in sales, all right? And you can say, well, you know, I'm pretty confident that I'm going to make between zero dollars and a million dollars in sales, okay? Um, <laughs> I'm 99.99% confident that it's gonna be somewhere between zero and a million dollars in sales. Okay, well, that you can be very confident that your, your numbers are gonna be between zero and a million, but that interval is not useful, okay? Your accountant is not gonna be able to do any kind of planning if you say the number is gonna be between zero and a million, okay? On the other hand, if you, um, you can give it a more narrow interval, all right, and you can say, all right, uh, it's probably gonna be between $15,000 and $16,000 next month, okay? Somewhere between fifteen dollars and $16,000. Then, um, then that's useful. We can make, uh, we can plan a budget accordingly, right? We can say, all right, well, um, we don't know exactly how much mo money we're gonna make, but we, let's say we're pretty confident it's gonna be between fifteen dollars and $16,000. Therefore, we can afford to buy this and this and this and stuff like that. But, because you're giving a much narrower range, it's also quite possible that uh, that that you're wrong, right? Uh, when you give such a small range from fifteen to sixteen thousand dollars, it's possible that your number of sales ends up only like thirteen thousand, or ends up at seventeen thousand, or something like that. Okay, and so so in general, narrower intervals are more useful. Okay, but a lot of times you're going to be less confident about um, having about P being exactly in that narrower interval, okay? So, you know, when I make uh, the 95% confidence interval, my margin of error ends up being around, uh, being 9%, right? So if I did this and I go through the calculations, um, I get, you know, 30% plus or minus 9%. So I go from 21 to 39%, my margin of error is this plus or minus 9%, so my margin of error is 0.09, okay? If I make a 99% confidence interval, all right, then the number of my critical value is 2.58 rather than 1.96, okay? Um, if you look at the calculations for a 99% versus a 95% confidence interval, the only number that changes is that critical value. It changes from 1.96 to 2.58. Everything else stays the same. But changing that to 2.58 changes your uh, margin of error to around 11.8%, okay? From 9% uh, to around 11.8%. And so um, my confidence interval goes from 18.2% to 41.8%, okay? So this results, going from 95 to 99% confidence interval, results in a wider interval, okay? All right, let's take a look at these intervals and ask, what kind of uh, conclusions can we make, right? So 
and we say we make a 95% confidence interval and ask, do we have evidence that the proportion P is different from 20%, okay? Our answer here is yes, okay? 20% is not between, is not within the bounds of my interval, okay? 20% is not between 21 and 39%, so it's not considered to be a plausible value, okay? And we'd say we have evidence that P is a value that's different from 20% 20, because 20 my interval goes from 21 to 39%. On the other hand, when I make a 99% confidence interval, my, uh, my confidence interval goes from 18.2% to 41.8%, okay? And we could ask, do we have evidence that the proportion P is different from 20%, okay? In this case, the answer is no, all right? 20% is within the bounds of our interval, okay? It goes, our interval goes from 18, percent to 41.8 percent so therefore 20 percent would be considered to be a plausible value okay oh this is a typo so we would say we can't say that we have we have evidence that p is a value that's different from sorry and this should say 20 percent okay and so um you know we're looking at the same data okay right we looked we surveyed 100 people 30 30 of them said they subscribed to netflix okay but we're making different conclusions. This one says, yes, 20%, you know, we're, we have evidence that P is different from 20%. Here we're saying, no, we don't have evidence that P is different from 20%, okay? Are these conclusions in conflict? Okay, do, they, do these conclusions contradict each other? And the answer is they are not in conflict. The difference is that we are choosing different levels of confidence, okay? Here we can say that P is different from 20%, 20%, but we're only 95% confident in our conclusion, right? You say, I'm 95% I'm I'm confident that it's not 20%, right? Someone says, I want you to be 99%. You know, 95%, I'm not, I don't, I'm not happy with that. I want you to be more confident. I want you to be 99% confident, okay? Well, if you want me to be more confident, then I have to be more cautious, right? right? If you want me to be more confident in the conclusion that I'm going to make, um, I have to be a little bit more cautious before I eliminate 20% as a possibility, right? And so if, if you want me to be 99% confident, then I'm not ready to eliminate 20% being a, a possibility, right? So um, if you want to kind of uh, avoid the risk of making any kind of mistake, you have to be uh, really cautious about kind of the, uh, the steps and the, the conclusions that you make, right? So if, it, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about like the pandemic and, and things like that. And, and you could say, well, you know, if you're, if you're willing to take, you know, some kind of risk or something, you know, maybe you're, you'd be willing to, um, I don't know, go to the grocery store and things like that. And, uh, but if, if, um, and so, you know, depending on your, you know, right now, like if, if you consider yourself to be healthy and uh, in a low risk profile, you know, you're, you're probably willing to go to the grocery store um, and you're not afraid of that, right? But then let's say you have a, a, a relative who is in a higher risk pool, okay? And you wanna be really confident that this person is not gonna get sick. So then you would say, you know, please don't go to the grocery store. You know, let me do the trips. I'll go to the grocery store and I'll bring you the groceries or things like that, right? And so the, the conclusions are, you know, are, are, are the decisions that, you are making, whether or not to go to the grocery store, is that in conflict? They're not in conflict. It's just that people are operating at kind of different risk profiles. And that's kind of what's going on here. Do we, can we say that 20% is, that the proportion is different from 20%? The answer is gonna depend on how confident you wanna be, okay? Are you okay with having, you know, being only 95% confident that, that there's a 5% possibility of making a mistake? then you can say, yeah, I'm pretty confident that it's not 20%. If that's not okay with you, right? If you want to be more confident in your answer, then you've got to be more cautious and you can't sit, uh, then you say, you know, I'm not ready to reject 20%. Uh, it's, it's kind of at the edge, but I'm not ready to reject it. It could be, it could be 20%. It's not necessarily 20%. We're not going to say that it is, but we're not ready to reject that possibility. Okay, um, that's, uh, that's kind of your first uh, bit on uh, confidence intervals. We're gonna um, uh, 
um, delve more into statistical inference uh, on Wednesday when we uh, introduce chapter eight and the hypothesis test. Um, and so um, we'll see you guys on Wednesday. Have a good day and uh, we'll see you then.